Good morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless our time in his word this morning. Father, we met those, meant those words that we just sang. There is nothing that could make us right with you except the blood of your Son, which he shed on Calvary 2,000 years ago. God, we are so thankful of what you have done for us to bring us into relationship with you, and to give us hope, and to give us something to look forward to in the future, and to give us um, just passion and fervency and purpose in this life. So God, as we open up your word this morning, I just ask that you would fill our minds with truth. Remind us of things we already know. And teach some of us things that maybe we don't know. But God, by that truth, I just ask that you would stir our affections, stir our hearts to love for your son. Stir our hearts to action that we might respond in faith and obedience. God, you must come among us now, or this time in your word will be fruitless. And so please be with us. Enlighten our minds and fill our hearts. We ask these things for the glory of your Son to be done. Amen. Well, our text this morning is a well-read portion of Scripture, and uh, one that many of you are probably very common with, uh, probably most often preached and heard on Easter. Uh, so if you would, uh, open up your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. If you're visiting and you're not familiar uh, with the layout of the Bible, it'll be closer to the back half. The Bible can be divided into two halves of New Testament and Old Testament. And when you get to the New Testament, uh, find Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, and then 1 Corinthians, and then near the back of that book, you'll find chapter 15. Many of you will immediately recognize this chapter as the chapter on the resurrection of the dead. It's probably most preached on Easter. And so the question immediately comes up, why in the world did Schuyler choose to preach a common Easter passage at the end of August, the last Sunday in August? Well, as many of you know, um, my twin brother and his wife, my sister-in-law, Katrina, lost Katrina's mom about a month ago to cancer. Um, three months ago, she was experiencing hip pain, and so she went into the doctor, and the doctor diagnosed her with stage four cancer. And within two months, she was gone. And many of you have probably experienced something similar in your life. And if you haven't yet, it's almost guaranteed to come in the near future. Um, in light of that, there's been a lot on my mind. Uh, there's been a lot on my mind in regards to death and to what we have to look forward to in the future. But in light of those things, um, we're prone to a certain set of responses, a wide range, but some more common than others, um, and I'm no stranger to those. Over the past month, I've had to wrestle with the fact of death and the fact that many people that I know now, maybe even some of you, could be gone this week, could be gone next month, could be gone this year. And in light of that, we're prone to respond in usually one of two ways. Some people have good responses to that, and there are good responses to the fact that life is short and life is but a breath. But we're also prone to do two things. Some of us are prone to realize life is short. And if I'm only gonna be here, you guys might be gone, I might be gone. I better pursue everything that I enjoy in life before I miss that opportunity. I better get that car that I want before I die. I better get married before I die. I really want to take a vacation to the Caribbean before I die. Whatever it is, we're prone in light of the brevity of life to pursue our passions, what we think will bring us satisfaction, what we want in this life before we pass away. And then others of us are prone to zero in on those relationships that we already have with friends, close friends, family, brothers, sisters, parents, children, and say, well, I don't know how much more time I'm going to get with them. So I need to maximize it. 
And so all we want to do is just spend time with those people, spend time in those relationships. And truth be told, some of us this morning, even without thinking about death, have fallen into those patterns of life. We've fallen into the pursuit of just our joys, our pleasures. We've fallen into the pursuit of just, I need to spend as much time with my loved ones as possible. And certainly it's okay for us to spend time with loved ones. Certainly it's okay for us to spend time doing some things we enjoy. And so if you have a golf outing planned this afternoon, go play golf. But I do ask this question. Is a life of self-focus, a life of self enjoyment, a life of self-gratification, the pursuit of our own pleasures, what we have been called to in Christ? The answer is no. We have not been called to that. I don't remember when we started First Peter, but a couple years, couple years ago. <laughs> Peter, in, in the book of First Peter, chapter 1, tells us to set your hope fully, not partially, not a little bit, not halfway, set your hope fully on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so let me ask you this morning, where is your hope? Is your hope on the time you're going to get to spend with your family this afternoon? Is your hope on the vacation that you're planning a couple months down the road? Is your hope in the house that you're hoping to buy somehow in this ridiculously expensive housing market of Denver? Or is your hope fully on the grace and the mercies and the treasures and the rewards that are to be brought to us when Christ returns. The author of Hebrews also gives us a similar message. In chapter 12, he's just finished recalling many of the great heroes of the faith and how they trotted through life and experienced the pains and the difficulties of life because of their faith and hope of what God was going to bring in the last days when he makes all things new and he restores all things and makes all things right. And then after looking at those great heroes of the faith, the writer of Hebrews says this, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses or testimonies, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And listen to this. He says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Jesus is the example that we are to follow in this. And he says, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Friends, Jesus went up on that cross knowing that he was going to bear God's wrath for sins. And the only way he was able to do that is he looked beyond the cross and he looked to the joy that was set before him. He looked to the people that he was purchasing. He looked to the worshipers that he was gaining. And for that joy, he was able to endure the cross. Well, in light of death, in light of the brevity of this life, in light of the sure struggles that we will endure. How do we get through that? And let me suggest to you this morning, and we will let Paul suggest to us this morning in 1 Corinthians 15, that the way we do that is not by setting our hope on this life. It is not by setting our hope on things being magnificent and fixed in this life. It is not by setting our hope on having all the best relationships, everybody living to old age and dying at the right time, but it is by setting our hope fully on the grace to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And when Christ returns, he will come, and his kingdom will be established, and he will rule forever. And many things will be fixed. Many things will be awesome and restored. And one of the main biblical emphases is, is that we will be raised from the dead. We will be raised from the dead to have a perfect body, a restored body, a renewed body, to live in forever and ever, and to worship the King of Kings. Hebrews 2 says that we've been set free from the fear of death. Ask yourself this morning, believer, are you living in such a way that displays that you are free from the fear of death? 
I hope so. But if not, and we all struggle from time to time, turn your attention with me to 1 Corinthians 15, and Paul will set our gaze straight forward to the hope that we have when Christ returns, our resurrection, and we will be set free, my prayer is, from the fear of death. Now we're going to go for a full-orbed view of 1 Corinthians 15 today. We're actually going to cover the whole chapter, which is 58 verses, which I think is probably a Southside record for verses covered in a sermon. Um, But we're not going to just dive in all over the place. We would be here until next week, I think. So um, I'm hoping that this full orb picture will help you just kind of put these brackets on 1 Corinthians 15 and pull it all together and get this really clear, focused picture of the resurrection that awaits us. So If you're taking notes and you want a quick outline for this passage, uh, the ESV actually breaks up 1 Corinthians 15 really well. Uh, And so your outline for this morning is four points. The first is the foundation of the resurrection. The second will be the certainty of the resurrection. The third will be the nature of the resurrection. And the fourth will be the necessity of the resurrection. And so turn your attention with me to verse 1. This is the foundation of the resurrection. Before I read that, Paul is writing 1 Corinthians to deal with a number of issues within the Corinthian church, both doctrinal teaching issues and practical issues. And here, when we come to chapter 15, Paul has in mind a doctrinal issue that also has very practical ramifications. And so we're going to touch on both those this morning. Well, what is this doctrinal issue? In verse 12... Paul mentions that some of the Corinthians are actually saying there is no resurrection from the dead. There is no resurrection from the dead. Now, Jewish belief at the time and Christian belief in the early church and now has always been that at the end of time, God is going to raise the dead back to life. And he's going to raise those who belong to him and give them eternal life with him. And those who are still rebellious, those who have rejected him, he will raise to judgment. But in Corinth here, there were people that were denying this resurrection from the dead. Now, it's not what we think of today when we think of people that deny supernatural resurrection from the dead. Uh, You might meet atheists today that would say, when you die, that's it. You're done. That is probably not the heresy that Paul was seeking to combat here. Uh, Within the culture at the time, there was a belief that everything physical was evil and bad, and that which was spiritual was good. And so the spiritual, while we were in our bodies, was kind of stuck. And so the ultimate reward for any person was to die and to be released from that physical entrapment, that physical body, that physical pain. And to a certain extent, you can understand why someone would come to that conclusion. I mean, if you just look at this earth, if you look at our bodies, If you look at all the things that we have to go through as we age and as people get sick or if you eat the wrong thing, it makes sense that some people would come to this conclusion. But that conclusion, the conclusion that there is no resurrection from the dead, absolutely cannot square with the Christian worldview, with the Christian view of history, with the Christian eschatology of what will come in the future. So it was a doctrinal issue, but it was also a practical issue. In chapter 30, uh, in verse 32, Paul, looking forward to what he anticipates for someone that holds this view, says, look, if the dead are not raised, let us eat, let us drink, for tomorrow we die. And his point was, look, if you're not going to get raised, you better enjoy the things of life that you can in the body now. If you enjoy that food, eat it. If you want to do that thing, do it. If you want to buy that car, buy it. The natural implication of not believing in the resurrection of the dead is to pursue self-pleasure, to pursue self-gratification. And so today I want our belief and our understanding of the resurrection to be crystallized so that we will not pursue self-pleasure, self-gratification, but we will pursue God's kingdom. We will pursue Christ's glory. We will pursue the name of Christ. So, 1 Corinthians 15.1. In order to combat this error, Paul turns somewhere that maybe you wouldn't expect. Verse 1, he says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received 
in which you stand and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Gospel means good news. And Paul had found very good news. He had preached this good news to the Corinthian church. They had received it. He says they now stand in it, and they are being saved by it. And so to Paul, the gospel is everything. The gospel is Paul's only hope. It is the deliverance from everything that plagues us in this life. It is the deliverance from everything that could plague us in the future when Christ returns. So what is this gospel that Paul prized so highly? Turn your attention to verse 3. Paul says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So the gospel is this, that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, and he lived a perfect life. And at the end of his life, instead of being anointed king, instead of being set over every person on the earth to reign, he was put to death on a cross. And the gospel says that on that cross, Christ was not only put to death, but he bore God's wrath for the sins of the world. He bore God's wrath for the sins of the world. And then he died. And he was buried. And after three days, he was raised back to life. And being raised back to life was God's way of stating he had accepted the sacrifice of Jesus for sins. He had accepted the sacrifice of Jesus for sins, and he had truly paid for our sins. And then after that, he appeared to many witnesses, including Paul. And those witnesses didn't just take that news and get in a huddle and stay where they were at, but they spread to all the world. And Paul took this message to Corinth, which is in modern Greece. And he preached the gospel to the Corinthians there. But verse 11, he says, We preach to you, and so you believed. Paul not only preached this gospel to the Corinthians, but the Corinthians believed it. Let me ask you this morning, before we go on to Paul's argument, have you believed the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you Turn to Christ to be your Savior from your sin. If you have, you have all the reason this morning to hope in a future resurrection from the dead where you will receive life and heaven and eternity with God. But if you haven't believed this gospel, if you haven't believed this good news, all that you have ahead of you is judgment. Christ says on the last day his voice will call out and the dead will come out of the graves. And those that belong to him will be raised to everlasting life and those that don't will be raised to a resurrection of judgment. Well, friends, if you don't believe this this morning, judgment awaits you, but there's an offer. This offer sits before you this morning to believe this gospel. Believe that Jesus died for your sins. Believe that Jesus took your guilt upon him. And if you do so, he will forgive you. And in that forgiveness, you will find that at that last day when Christ returns, you will be raised from the dead. You will be raised from the dead. Now, you might be wondering, what in the world does the gospel have to do with the resurrection of the dead? Um, You just look at these verses and you just separate the passages. You're like, well, I don't really understand. I don't really understand where Paul is going with this. Well, let me assure you that this next portion of Scripture, starting in verse 12, is perhaps the most sound, sit down in your seat and shut your mouth logic in all of the Bible. Um, You cannot argue with this logic. This is sound logic. And so look with me at verse 
12 and 13, this is our second point, the certainty of the resurrection. Our resurrection is absolutely certain to occur. Now if the dead, or sorry, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. You get what he's saying? It's simple logic, but sometimes it eludes us. Paul is saying this, in the gospel, Jesus Christ is proclaimed as having died for sins. And in the gospel, Jesus Christ is, having, is proclaimed as having risen for our justification. Now then, if you want to say there is no resurrection of the dead, how can you say that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead? And so for these people in Corinth to be saying there was no resurrection of the dead is foundationally to disagree and to deny the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this has massive implications for our faith. Look at verse 14. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. Friends, the true Christian message, the Christian faith, is absolutely dependent on Jesus Christ having been risen from the dead. And if he didn't rise from the dead, our faith is totally pointless. Because our faith is that he died for our sins and that he raised, he was raised from the dead for our justification. And if he did not really, if he was not really raised from the dead, then he did not really die for our sins. And his sacrifice was not accepted. And so we are still in our sins. And so our faith is pointless. He says, you are still in your sins. And in verse 18, listen to this also. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Anybody who has died that had this faith in Christ, that Christ has paid for my sins. Katrina's mom, Gloria. Uh, Joe's wife, Jan Triplett. They died in Christ. But if Christ was not raised from the dead, they were still in their sins. And so they have perished. They have perished. Well, friends, if we're still in our sins, we really are, of all people, most to be pitied. I mean, we come here every Sunday. We have this book open to us. We listen to preaching about someone who supposedly saved us from our sins, and yet he died, and our sins aren't actually forgiven. What in the world are we even doing here? And not only that, Christians give up the pursuit of the pleasures of the flesh. And Christians throughout the world either face scorn, mock, ridicule for their faith, or in many places, North Africa, the Middle East, India, Nepal, face actual physical persecution physical suffering, physical torturing, physical death. All for naught if Christ has not been raised. And there might be some of you here this morning, you agree with that. You think, man, these Christians are pathetic. There's no way that Christ was actually raised from the dead. And you think we're actually all in a truly sad state. Well, whether that's your opinion or not, Turn your attention to verse 20. Paul says, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. How could Paul possibly know that? How could we possibly know that Paul knew what he was talking about? Was Christ actually raised? Well, we can know, and we can know with confidence. Turn your attention back to verse 4. I love hearing pages flip. Christ was buried, and then he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. The death and resurrection of Christ was not a singular event in history apart from everything else that was going on in God's plan. But in fact, Christ's death and resurrection was predicted, both in the Old Testament, and you can find it in many places, and in Christ's own life, by his own words, he says, I will lay my life down that I might take it up again. 
And so Jesus' death was not just something that supposedly happened. It was predicted in the Scriptures. And so when someone says it happened, give ear to that. Give ear to that. But what about this testimony that has been shared from Paul? How could we possibly believe that what he is sharing with us? Well, in verses 5 and following, Paul makes a very clear point that Christ personally appeared to Cephas, who was Peter. He appeared to more than 500 other brothers in Christ. Then he appeared to James, probably Christ's brother. Then to all the apostles, and then he appeared to Paul. And those who doubt might say, well, they could just be trying to fool us. It's like a power grab so they can control us. Friends, if you know what happened to all of those men, almost all of those men listed there, almost without exception, they were put to death for saying that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Peter, crucified upside down. Paul, beheaded. Some disciples ran through with a spear. Many tortured almost all of them put to death. Let me ask you this question. If you doubt the validity of these claims of Christ's resurrection, why would someone who personally knew Jesus Christ and knew that they did not actually see Jesus rise from the dead allow themselves to be tortured, suffer, and killed in some of the most painful ways in human history for something that they knew was a lie? No power grab is worth that. And let me suggest to you this morning that because of that, we can absolutely trust this eyewitness testimony that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Now, if you're smart, you might be thinking, still the doubter, okay, the dead can be raised, but maybe, maybe Christ was the only exception to that rule, and we're actually just all going to die and never be raised, be freed from the body Look again at verse 20. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. There's a lot of theology in those verses. But in its simplest form, what Paul is saying is that Jesus Christ was just the first of many to be raised from the dead. He's the first of many who will be made alive. And when Christ returns, he will return. Mark it down. All who belong to him will be given new life. All who have believed the gospel will be given new life. If you have trusted Jesus Christ... For salvation from your sins, you will receive new life when Christ returns. Your body will be raised. You will be given a new body. Look at verse 24. Then comes the end when Christ delivers the kingdom of God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Friends, if you're here this morning, And you have believed this gospel, you have a hope of a resurrection. But if you do not believe the gospel, this is what awaits you. Christ will put every enemy under his feet. He will destroy every enemy, including death. That's what awaits you. But if you would trust Christ, turn from your sins, and submit to Christ as your Lord and Savior. You don't have to look forward to Christ coming and destroying you. Instead, you look forward to Christ coming and delivering you forever. That's a good hope to have. That's an awesome hope to have. And so this resurrection is certain because Christ was raised from the dead. Because Christ was raised from the dead, we can know for certain that those who belong to Jesus Christ will be raised in the last day. Will be raised. That should change things. But we got to keep moving because i got a lot of verses still to cover. In verse 35, skip down a little bit, Paul anticipates his next objection. And this objection, for most of us, is actually something we probably wonder quite a bit about. 
And the objection is this. All right, Paul, I'll grant to you that maybe the, the dead are raised. But what is the body that's going to be raised going to be like? Verse 35, someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Basically, they're saying, Paul, are you telling me, oh, well, maybe we are raised from the dead. Are you telling me we're going to be raised in this piece of junk? I think most of us hope that we aren't going to be raised in this piece of junk. <laughs> and for those of you that hope you do, and there's some of you maybe, that all you have to do is eat too much dairy and the rest of us are hoping you're not raised in that piece of junk either. <laughs> Someone thought that was way too funny. <laughs> I have lactose intolerance, so I was insulted there. <laughs> Good news. What is to come in the resurrection is not this piece of junk. It is something far better, far better. In verse 36 and following, Paul is going to compare our current bodies to our resurrection bodies by way of analogy. And the analogy he's going to use is that of planting a seed. Verse 36, he says, You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. And this is the analogy. You throw a seed in the ground. You plant it. I don't know how long it takes seeds to come out of the ground. I'm not a farmer. But when it comes out, it doesn't look the same. It's not the same seed. It's got the same substance, everything that was in the seed. But now, all of a sudden, you get a big tree start growing out of it. And that tree is so much more magnificent than what that seed was. But that seed was thrown in the ground and it died. And what was raised out of the ground was something far more magnificent. And that's the case with every single plant, every single seed that I can think of. If you have a seed that comes up looking uglier, let me know. So he then moves on with this con contrast to compare our bodies, what is sown in our death, with what will be raised in the resurrection. And these details are admittedly a little ambiguous in verse 42 and following, but they do give us a little glimpse, a little picture. And I hope they excite you. So look with me at verse 42. What do we have awaiting us in this resurrection? Paul says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, and what is raised is imperishable. In verse 53, he says something similar. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. And what he's saying is the body that is to come, it's going to be immortal. It will not die. It will not break down. It will not tear things in its shoulders or its knees. It won't require jaw tooth surgery. It won't get Alzheimer's. Anything that you can think of, of your body breaking down, your body decomposing, <coughs> no more. This new body can't do it. It is in perfect health forever and ever and ever. And then in verse 43, it is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. Now there's disagreement on what exactly Paul means here. But I think if you look back up in verse 40 and 41, Paul is contrasting the glory of heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. And he moves on to contrast the glory of a star to another star, to a moon, to the sun. And all I can think of when I think of the stars and the moon and the sun and their glory is those are things that are worth looking at. They are pretty to look at. They make you just awestruck. They make you say, whoever made that is awesome. Now, don't go look at the sun. That will blind you. But I think what Paul is getting at here is that these new bodies are going to be something to look at. They're going to be something that we can look at someone else and say, God is amazing. God is awesome that he would create something so magnificent and allow us to house ourselves in it. How awesome is that? Also in verse 43, it is sown in weakness and it is raised in power. Some think that this might speak to having superhuman strength. I don't know if that's necessarily true because Jordan Murphy already has that. 
Some think that maybe we'll be able to walk through walls like it seems like maybe Christ did after he was raised from the dead, or we'll be able to move super fast, but I don't think that's what Paul is getting at here, although I hope that is part of it. I think what Paul is speaking here to is really the ability for us to carry out the will and worship of God. These bodies are so weak, and oftentimes the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Martin Lloyd-Jones, perhaps the greatest expositor in history, for sure the greatest expositor of the 20th century, the greatest teacher and proclaimer of Scripture and proclaimer of Christ, commenting on this particular detail, said, I will finally be able to proclaim Christ as he deserves. That's something that's worth having. I think we all agree, Charles Wesley, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. We wish we had more tongues to sing God's praise. And all the worship in this room this morning was not enough for what Christ deserves. But in these new bodies, raised in power, our tongues will finally sing the glories and the praises of Christ that he deserves. This last detail of the nature of the resurrection. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There's a lot of discussion about what's meant here. I think at the end of the day, what it means is that these bodies that we've been given are fit here for this temporary earth. And the new bodies that we will be given will be fit for an eternal heaven and eternal earth where the spirit and the physical meet forever. Whatever exactly is in store for us, I think we can look with joy, knowing that we will be like Christ. Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. We're going to be like Jesus. I hope that makes your heart sing. Not just that you are certain to be raised, but you are to be raised like Jesus. We will be like him in all all his perfections. We will not be God, but we will never sin again. And all the praise due to God we will be able to render unto him. All the will of God we will be able to accomplish without fail. How much of our discouragement in this life is because we fail to follow God's will, to follow God's instruction? Never again. Never again. Some of you might still think, well, why does it matter? In the end, I just want to be with Jesus. And I can certainly understand that sentiment. But friends, it matters because it's absolutely necessary. Look at verse 50. This is the necessity of the resurrection. And we're running out of time, so we're just pretty much going to read through this section. I tell you this, brothers. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. This resurrection is necessary because we are not now fit to worship God forever as he deserves, nor are we able to do so. That which is coming is going to be imperishable and it is going to last forever. And that which we are in now does not last forever. And if we in these bodies were to step into God's kingdom, into God's presence, we would perish in an instant. But these new bodies, raised, will be able to dwell with God forever and ever. Isn't that the pinnacle of Revelation 21 at the end of the Bible? God will dwell with his people He will be their God, and they will be his people, and we will finally be able to do so. It's beautiful. Well, read with me the rest of this section through verse 57. This is the necessity of the resurrection. We're not going to discuss it at all. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, 
and the mortal puts on immortality. Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, this is what we have to look forward to. A resurrection. A resurrection. And in closing, let me just turn your attention to Paul's final words in verse 58. We said at the beginning, this issue is both doctrinal, what is true, what is taught, and practical. What should this result in? And Paul gives us that here. Verse 58, he says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, in light of all of that, in light of the foundation of your resurrection, that Jesus Christ bore the wrath for your sins, was died and raised from the dead, in light of the certainty of your resurrection, it is coming. It is coming. In light of the nature of your resurrection, our bodies will be glorious like Christ's. And in light of the necessity of the resurrection, therefore, brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is the cure from the fear of death. When family dies, when those we are close to die, how do we not fall into those things we discussed at the beginning? the pursuit of self-pleasure, self-gratification, the zeroing in on, I'm only going to spend my time with my loved ones because I don't know how much time we have left. It is the resurrection. It is the resurrection because you might only have five years left with someone you love here, but if they're in Christ and in you're, in, you're in Christ, you have forever together in perfect bodies to praise Christ together. So be steadfast, immovable. This has the idea of just, you're, you're not pushed off to the left or to the right to pursue this or that or some fading pleasure. And this resurrection frees us not to live life for ourselves. It frees us to give whatever days, months, years we have left for the work of the Lord. The word translated abounding here is elsewhere translated lavish. And it has the idea of something overflowing. And friends, in light of the resurrection, we don't just do some things for Christ and some things for self. In light of the resurrection, in light of the fact that we are going to live forever, our whole life should be overflowing with the works of the Lord. Why do you go to your workplace? Do you go to your workplace just so you can get a paycheck and you can get a boat to take out on those tiny reservoirs in here they call lakes? Do you go to get a paycheck so you can buy a house? Or do you go to work to be a light of the gospel of Jesus Christ and shine that light to your coworkers? Do you go to work to tell them about Jesus Christ? When you're raising your children, are you just raising them so that they'll sit in a nice row at church? Or are you raising them so that they, at the proper time, in God's timing, will see the beauty of Jesus Christ and will submit to him and will turn their lives over to him and be saved. Friends, everything we do is for the work of the Lord. We are to abound in it because of the resurrection. Abound in it because of the resurrection. And so I think it might even be safe to say, these perishing bodies, burn them out for Jesus. Don't try and hold on for 200 years. Burn them out for Jesus. You have a resurrection coming. You have eternity with all these brothers and sisters coming. And this is just this room. How many brothers and sisters in the world are gathered together right now? You have eternity with them. And you have eternity in a body. So let us abound in the work of the Lord. Let us not, in fear of death, turn towards ourselves and our self-pleasures, but let us live forever for him. Let's pray. Father, what a hope we have in Jesus. If it wasn't enough that you had forgiven our sins and that you had made us right with you and promised us eternity with you, you have also promised us 
a resurrection body with which we will be able to worship you for all of eternity, pain-free, sin-free, full of joy, full of gladness. God, I pray that you would direct our hearts this morning in light of this truth, not to just go out and forget the resurrection, but that we would be strengthened and encouraged to go and live our lives for your Son, our Savior, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God, we thank you. We ask that you would do these things among us for the glory of your Son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.